Last Sunday we learned from the Bible on Esther. Hope you all enjoyed about Esther. Yep. And today we want to learn from God's word on a lady called Ruth. Her name is Ruth. We're going to look at some principles of leadership from God's holy word. From the life of Sister Ruth. And it's a beautiful story in the Bible, just four chapters in that book, talking about God's grace permeates, percolates, passes through, turning our mistakes into miracles, turning our mistakes into messages. You don't make a mistake for God to make it a miracle. No, that's wrong. But when you've done a mistake and you repent about it, saying, God, I'm sorry, I made a mistake by mistake. And God turns it into a miracle. And that's really the story of the life of Ruth. Just four chapters, you all can go home and read it and buy hard it. It's very easy. So different from the life of Esther, the life of Ruth. Shall we look at that? Let's go to uh, one portion we'll read. Esther chapter 1, I think is verse 16 onwards. Let's read that together. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. And where thou die, I'll die. And where... So the Lord do me, and more also, if aught but death part the end. Okay, that was old English. We will look at what she actually said in Bangalore English. The story. <clears throat> There's this uh, city or town called Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is a very popular city today because... Bethlehem is the birthplace of the Lord Jesus. It's an important tourist spot on the global map. You know, it's one of the most visited places on the planet Earth today. But when the story happened about 2,800, 3,000 years ago, this story happened in a setting where Bethlehem, the only thing about it was Rachel, the beloved wife of Jacob, was buried there. Nothing else really happened there. Caleb's son had built up that city. His name was Solomon. So the history of Bethlehem is nothing great. But the name of Bethlehem, Bethlehem means Bethel, house of God. Ahem, bread, house of bread, God's house of bread. Bethlehem actually meant house of bread. And guess what happened? There was famine in house of bread. Ain't it funny that sometimes what you expect the opposite comes out of it. I've seen people with names like praise and the only thing they don't do is... <laughs> There's a story in the Bible about how Jesus entered a city called Nain, which had gates called Beautiful. And guess what was coming out? Dead body. There's nothing beautiful about that. Sometimes names and character are so drastic. It is just mind-boggling. There used to be a lady in our church. Her name was Glory. Our Tamil church. I was a part of that for some time. And uh, my childhood. Glory used to always, auntie. She was auntie. Because, you know, in India, anybody older than you is uncle and auntie, right? So, uh, she was auntie Glory. Glory auntie. And uh, she would always say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, while praying, amen, amen, amen. But the word Glory, she never said. Because somehow, probably because her name is Glory, she always used other words to praise God. And we kids, when we want to irritate her, when we are in small, you know, those days churches were much smaller, and we sit beside her and we always, instead of saying hallelujah, we say glory, 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 glory. <laughs> and she gives us that look with the corner of her eye. <laughs> the only thing that Glory Auntie didn't have was glory. Sometimes names are so opposite to conditions. Bangalore is called the garden city. <laughs> when was the last time you saw a garden anywhere? Names sometimes are so 
different from reality and Bethlehem became a city of famine and that is so outrageous sometimes that Bethlehem the promised city of God in the promised land of God a place where Jesus would be born could have famine and sometimes I want to tell you even if you're a right person wrong things can happen people ask questions like can God's children fall sick can God's children have accidents will God's children have problems answer is yes but they won't stay there for long God's children will come out of it <laughs> famine famine can happen for a variety of reasons the cities that were adjoining Bethlehem affected Bethlehem and there was famine sometimes famine comes because of wrong thinking God's children go through famine not because of the devil not because of others but because of their own poor thinking I was studying on this concept and I was surprised to find that a lot of times poverty famine struggles come in our life because of our own wrong thinking some you know since we are also doing leadership uh, this is something I wrote down I thought you like it many people who are weak in life are people who watch lots of TV and waste a lot of time surfing on the net and uh, games and all that which takes away the time they are supposed to focus on real life and real problems they escape through these kind of methods and they generally tend to live in famine, in necessity, in want. They don't have abundance. When they really require time, they don't have it. When they require money, they don't have it. When they require resources, they don't have it. When they require relationships, they don't have it. Why? Because they wasted their time on things that were unnecessary. Weak people eat lots of junk food. Uh, because they're very careless of their health. They don't care. You know, they just, they just love junk food because they don't care about being nutritious or vitamins. They really don't care about it. Their, their Pentecostal song is, where he leads me, I will follow. What I see, I will swallow. <laughs> and that kind of a, it, it's a famine mentality. <laughs> These are people who are weak. They don't buy what they want. They buy what is available on discount. Why did you buy that? It was cheap. How are you going to use it? I don't know. <laughs> These are people who waste time early in life and regret it later in life. They cause famine on themselves. In fact, one of the leadership paradigms says, you must know what you want to do early in life and manage the decision throughout your life. But people who walk in famines do so because they keep changing their goalposts. They keep changing their aims. <laughs> they tend to waste time. Weak people have hobbies and addictions and things they are not excellent. For example, okay, you're good. You're good in cricket. But you know you're not excellent in cricket. You know that you can't do a Ranji Trophy in cricket. You know you can't take forward in the state level. You know you can't earn from cricket. You're just good. But being good does not mean you can invest your life into it. You should invest your life only where you're excellent. So people end up investing their life where they're just average, just good. They're good in singing, but are you excellent? Can, can that become a career in life? Not really. Then why do you waste your money and time on things you're not excellent? No, it's a hobby I like. Hey, hobbies can become destructive and lead you to famines. Excessive spending of time, talents, treasure on things that you are not excellent in can tomorrow lead you to famine from which you can't come out. <laughs> mannerisms. Weak thinkers have mannerisms and etiquettes which are very low and low self-respect. You know, when I, was, when I was studying this about leadership, uh, and I put it down in simple garb, uh, in simple English. Uh, I was thinking of my own life. <clears throat> when I used to dress up for English service, uh, what we had, what, 40 people, 80 people those days in the church, 100 people, small church. But uh, 
I didn't have suits that time. Now, uh, uh, I, I did have some blazers, some coats, where I just, you know, wear it with matching pants. And many times people would say, hey, that's not matching. I'd tell them, no, this is the latest Italian style. And then they'll go, oh, yeah, but it looks good. Huh? Yeah, perspective is everything. Since you all are ready for a joke, I'll tell you one joke. This is not a part of the syllabus. This is bonus. Now, I bought a table. This is so funny. I bought a table. It's a glass table. Okay, actually what happened is I bought a glass and then found out that there is no good table to hold it. That was actually somehow it was wrong planning. That time our office was in Church Street, uh, MG Road. I didn't have an office here. I had an office there. So I went to Shivaji Nagar looking for a stand to hold the glass and make it a table. You know, those days everything was like, we, we are very careful about every pie because you didn't have money. So we care, care, I still am careful. Um, so I finally found this, you know, thing. And I don't know if Brother Gladdy is here today. Me and Gladdy, we picked it up. Are you here, Brother Gladdy? By any chance? So anyway, okay, here comes one of the services. So me and Gladdy went, we picked it up from Shivaji Nagar. We come back, we fix it up and people just came and Gladdy told some people we got it from Shivaji They're like, oh no, Pastor, this doesn't look good for your office. I said, excuse me, what did you say? Pastor, MG Road, Church Street, this is not matching with your office. I said, what's wrong with you? They said, no, you got it from Shivaji Nagar. Then I understood the problem. They have low self-esteem about Shivaji Nagar. <laughs> Anything from Shivaji Nagar, uh -huh. So I understood the problem. So I said, we took it from Shivaji Nagar, we picked it from there. But do you know what? This is a special novelty piece from Germany. The special design. Gladi was staring at me, I said, just calm down. <laughs> and then of course Gladi goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just picked it from there. And then one said to the next, everybody, they don't want to look at the office. They want to look at the table. Man, pastor God, the table. Look at those pipes. Ooh. <laughs> look at that glass. Ooh. Perspective, value changed. No one will keep coffee cup on it. Why? German table. <laughs> Perspective. Me and Gladdy had the laugh of our life. And then, of course, when, before everything was over, I had to make a confession and I said, well, now that you all respect the table, it's from the roadside, Shivaji Nagar, <laughs> but respect it. It's still there in the pastoral room. Every time you look at it, please remember it's from Germany. You will value it. The point I'm making is this. People who don't value themselves will often walk in famines of life. Learn to respect what you have. Carry yourself good. I was telling about previous years and I was thinking about it. You know, those days when church had just 40, 80 years, 80 people or 100 people, small church. I would dress up. Uh, those days I didn't have suits, I just had blazers. I got my first suit when I went to Dubai. I was preaching in Dubai and one man noticed that I was just having blazers and was wearing it with matching trousers. So he said, you need to have a suit. I said, you know time and you know. So he thought I really didn't have time. He didn't know I didn't have money because I don't behave like I don't have money. I have money, it's just that God's got it. And uh, sometimes we have to talk to him a lot for him to supply. So he took me to a tailoring shop and got my first royal blue color suit stitched. That's how I got my first suit. It's a gift from Dubai after preaching. He was a Sindhi man from Pakistan and he got saved and he fell in love with me and he bought me the suit. Now, what happened is, in Bangalore, when I started the church, I, I would always, you know, whatever, I, I used to borrow ties from people, friends, I, I'd actually not borrow, just pick it up and just let them know I'd actually take on your tie. And uh, they were friends, you know, so, and, and my dad's ties and just, just wear it and look smart and preach. My dad many times, even my dad would many times tell me, John, Johnson, you don't have to be so overdressed. Look at the people that you pastor. I mean, dress like them. Why do you have to? 
So just to show him, I would take off the blazer and put it in the side. And when he goes, I take it back again, you know, <laughs> and go to church. And he would tell me, look at the people you're pastoring. You know what? I never dressed up for the people I pastored. I dressed up for the future church that I knew God was leading me into. <laughs> I want to say this to you. I, I, know, I know my dad had his best intentions for me in his mind. I know that he meant what he said in the way that was right from his context. I understand that. But listen, you've got to carry yourself as a child of the living God. Young people, listen to me, especially teenagers. Britney Spears is not your stylist. Lady Gaga is not your leader. Bollywood is not the one you are following. You are a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You've got to carry yourself. Oh, come on, somebody clap like you mean it. You see, you've got to carry yourself like a child of the King of Kings. You belong to God Almighty. You don't want those torn jeans and those shabby looking clothes on you. That's not style. That's what slum people wear. <laughs> That's not style. I'm not against style. You've got to look stylish. You've got to be appropriate and relevant for your community. But you don't have to degrade yourself. You have to upgrade yourself. Because you're a child of the living God. Famine mentality can cause famine in life. And we've got to be people who behave like you are in Bethlehem. So unfortunately this lady and her family who lived in Bethlehem, her name is Naomi. Naomi's husband was Elimelech. Don't have to remember names, not important. Elimelech had two sons. One's name was Maliol and other's name was Chilion. Not important. So four of these people leave Bethlehem and go to a place called Moab. It's very sad. You know what? Even if Bethlehem has got famine, even if where you are in God's will has got problems, don't leave God's will. Don't run away from God's purpose. But they made the mistake of going out of Bethlehem into a land called Moab. And what's the problem of Moab? Moab is a cursed place. How did Moab come into the picture? The family of four, they moved. They're like Bangaloreans, right? We keep shifting houses, come on. No, we've got a job somewhere else, move from there, uh, move to there, got a job elsewhere, move to the next place. Sometimes it takes longer to go from one point of Bangalore to another point of Bangalore than going from Bangalore to a nearby city like Mysore or Gulbarga or something like that. Man, the traffic in Bangalore can be crazy when we are not driving and it's sad we need to pray for our city and our nation so anyway these people were moving like any city people they moved from Bethlehem to a place called Moab but the problem of Moab is Moab was a cursed community what was the problem of Moab cursed how did they get cursed that's a long story to cut it short there's this guy called Abraham we all know father Abraham now, he had a, a relative called Lot, L-O-T, Lot. It was a lot of problem. And so finally Abraham said to Lot, Lot, you go. So he, his wife, his children all went to a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were so wicked that God said, I'm going to rain fire and brimstones on them and kill them. God said, I don't want them alive because they don't want me. So they're out of this place. Let them go into eternity and decide whatever they want for themselves. They want a life without me, okay, but they don't destroy my planet Earth. They don't confuse what I've created for their manipulation. So God said, I'm going to rain fire and brimstone. You heard of Dead Sea? Salt Sea, Dead Sea. Now, Dead Sea is in Israel. It's in the Transjordan area. Okay, it's away from Jerusalem. So it's, uh, this is the place where nobody commits suicide in that sea. Nobody, it's the only sea in the world, no one committed suicide. Just statistics. No one, every other sea in the world, people have ended their life, incidentally or accidentally. But in the Dead Sea, no one can commit suicide. You know why? You won't drown. It's the water with the highest buoyancy. It's so saline, it's so sulfuric, you can't dip in that. You can lie down and have a cup of coffee. Those who don't know how to swim and you still want to float on water, Come on, baby, Dead Sea. That's your destination. 
just no problem you won't sink there there's no life there in there are no fishes no one does fishing there are no fishes there not even bacteria is there because nothing lives there's no life in dead sea and dead sea historically was the land where sodom and gomorrah was and god had rained fire and brimstone on that place even today it exists as a sign of what can happen if you turn god on the wrong way and the bible says that this place before god could rain fire and brimstone on the sinfulness of mankind that lived in that part lot and his wife and everyone went there because it was a beautiful place they all were living there and you know they were they didn't belong to sodom and gomorrah but they kind of you know what i'm saying they the kind of adjusting cope they kept themselves holy but they can't say no to everything now you know what i'm saying we got to be reasonable now so they were in that situation so god said i'm going to rain fire and brimstone and god was talking to abraham why because god and abraham are friends and abraham's relative lot is there so god said i'm going to rain fire and brimstone abraham said please my relative is there god said if there is one righteous i will spare that whole city and then god commanded angel said go bring that fellow out angels came to lot's house saying god is going to destroy the city come out he says no talk about lazy people man angels come to the house angel came to mother mary she said i am ready to get pregnant with jesus angel came to zacharias he asked two extra questions but was dumb until he had the child wherever angels come people listen lot is the only fellow who said mm -mm. i'm not listening angel said come out Lord said if you all are in a hurry you go i am not coming actually when i compare lord's life and our church people life you all are holy <laughs> pure compared to this fellow angels had to pull him anybody this morning you came because angels pulled you nobody you came out of free will this fellow angels pulled him think of a cat children tied a leash around its neck and they're pulling cat will never go forward cat walks backward that's the cat nature it's called cat sociology no i'm just making it important but <clears throat> cat that's exactly what lot is doing angels are pulling him forward he's pulling back angel said there's no more time move out chased him out and said run to the next city he says no can i at least go nearby i can't go to the other city god's angels pull out the daughters and the wife pull them out pa if you people were alive when bible was written by god your names would have been here because we were not there these fellow stories are written <laughs> think about it anybody here angel came and picked you and put you in the water and lifted you for baptism no you obeyed god by yourself this fellow angels pulled him out but what surprises me is god's mercy god why are you pulling let him die now mm -mm. my servant abraham is praying god says i can't look at abraham's face if something happens to lot you know what many of you are seated here because god was honoring somebody's prayer Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My brother, my sister, when those teardrops flow down your cheeks and your knees hit the floor and your head is hung down in prayers and you're talking to God and you think nothing is happening for you, you feel God, why are you not answering my prayer? You don't know, boy. There are angels of God at disposal pulling your future, touching the matters of your life, though you don't see it. It is happening. Oh, somebody give him the glory and the thanks. Hallelujah. My God is a real God. He's a prayer answering God. He's a loving God. That's the God we serve. Abraham doesn't know he's praying. He doesn't know angels are pulling Lot, throwing him out. Pada. Some of you should have been dead on the bike. That boy should have destroyed your life, but it was your mama's prayer. 
I just got an SMS, Joshua, wherever you are, he attended the last service. After hearing the first service message, he sent me a text message on my mobile and I checked it after the first service. It says, Pastor, yesterday I was flying to Bangalore from Hyderabad. We got on the plane. All of a sudden, in Bangalore, my wife felt like praying, so she stopped her, all her work and just knelt down in prayer, praying for me. And that's the time when the pilot said they suddenly found a technical snag in the flight. They had to stop it and correct it, else it could have been dangerous. How true it is. So many times God inspires people to pray for different things because he has got his angels to work on your behalf. Don't ignore inspirations to pray. Okay. Angels pull the family out and say, go. They say, no, we can't go to the city where you're saying, we'll go to the nearby hill, hill station. Angels say, go anywhere. Go from here. You know, never negotiate with God. If God says something, just obey it. When God says, go to the nearby city, just go there. Don't choose your place and ask, can I go, can I go? God will finally say, go ma, go. But that will become a curse in your life. God's will is a blessing in your life and your choice is a compromise in your life. Don't negotiate with God, just humbly obey. Hallelujah. Many of our Christian prayers are, God, thy kingdom come, so my will can be done. That's not how Jesus taught us to pray. He taught us to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And that's really how we should be praying. But these guys, they are running to a hill. They are not actually running, they are walking to a hill. Angels pushing them. Now that's when Mrs. Lot, her name is not in the Bible. Mrs. Lot, Lot's wife. Mrs. Lot had a lot of feelings about old house. Because she had just went shopping last week and bought the china and the porcelain and just bought a new dining set and a dishwasher and just got the plumber to fix everything. And she was thinking, oh my God, we're leaving everything and running. Because some angels came. That, that feelings for the old house, she turned back. The Bible says she became pillar of salt. After the first service, I asked my son, what part of the message did you like? And he says, Dad, that one where the wife was running and she and he was showing me in action. He was showing it to me in action. And the wife turned and she became a pillar of salt. Actually, what happened was, God said, I'm going to curse Sodom and Gomorrah and turn them into a lake of salt. And because this lady's heart is still there, let her become a pillar of salt. The daughters and the father ran up to the hill and they saw the fire and the brimstones fall down and they were scared and they saw the whole city and the fumes of it going up, burning. But you know, Sodom and Gomorrah had gotten to these girls. How do you know when sin gets into you? It's like this. Mm -hmm. You know more tunes of Bollywood songs than church hymns. Heavenly Father, they understood it, but they didn't like it. <laughs> you know there is more Sodom and Gomorrah in you when you can go to a shopping mall or to a movie theater and have no problem buying movie tickets and spending on stuff you know is just useless, but you have big problem when it comes to putting the money in the offering bag. Ah. Look at someone beside you and say, he is preaching about us now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah It comes in slowly But it comes in surely This young two ladies They got their father to get drunk And he's fully drunk And they had sexual relationship with their own father Incest And children were born to these two girls In their relationship with their own father and that's how Moab was born. The community of Moab was born like that. And they hated Abraham's family. Are Baba, you did all this nonsense. You become a community. Why do you have problem with Abraham? He is the one who prayed for you. 
when kings came and attacked you he came and helped you and protected you he fed you people why are you angry they have only helped you sinners don't like righteous people you know why because their father is not our father the father of the righteous is god almighty the father of sinfulness is the demonic powers and the children of darkness just cannot accommodate children of light they just don't like and what happened when the children of israel came out of egypt you know the first people who attacked them at rephidim etc and then who are the people who continuously attack them moabites moabites they brought all kinds of attack against israel moab you just mind your business israelites are going to their own promised land no 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 we don't like them they went ahead their king balak hired a prophet called balaam to curse israel moabites moabites don't like israelites mhm mm so much so that in deuteronomy chapter 23 god said moabites will never come into my presence they will never come into the temple to worship me now we're thinking oh moab is a cursed pe people cursed place yes but do you know our hero david he also once went to moab not only elimelech and naomi but even david once went to moab in the book of 1 samuel i was shocked when i read that i thought man because david was like kind of someone i enjoy reading about i thought david in moab but you know how david escaped when david went to moab why did david go to moab saul wanted to kill him in israel so he ran away to moab for safety god sent a prophet called gad and god's prophet gad g a d he came and told david god says get out from here david didn't ask questions what's wrong with moab huh nothing he just obeyed he didn't say israel is going to kill me philistines are going to kill me the only buffer zone between the two the peacekeeping treaty is here you know it's a comfort zone nothing he said if god wants me to live under the shadow of death i will but i'll obey god wherever he wants me and he got out of moab <laughs> hallelujah oh somebody say a big thanks to jesus you know if you have a listening heart god will send you a speaking word if you have a listening heart god will send you a speaking word we must have a listening heart david got out from there now what happened in moab this Na naomi's two children got married one's name was one's one son's name was orpa other son's no one son's wife's name was orpa the other son's wife's name was ruth orpa and ruth she got two daughter in laws when they both got married both the sons died and husband died now three ladies are there this beautiful family became a ladies association three ladies naomi the jewish woman and two daughter in laws i don't want to use the word daughter in laws i'll use the word daughter in grace let your mother in law be a mother in grace let your daughter in law be daughter in grace it's not the law that keeps you together it's the grace that keeps you together so orpa and ruth two daughter in grace now they hear that the famine in bethlehem is over i told you even if a child of god goes through famine in bethlehem god will change the times then they said we have to go back we have to go back to our town so this naomi says to her two daughter in grace i want to go back to my country my husband is dead my sons are dead you guys go back to your parents so the elder one orpa said okay good idea mo i'll go but ruth said i won't go so nam naomi told ruth darling look at your co-sister she went back to her people and to her gods you also go back to your people and to your gods moabite community said we will not have the god of abraham we want our own gods because god of abraham is a living god he has got conditions we want to make our own god so that he'll be according to our condition so moab had their own gods and then what happened this people go back 
except Ruth. Ruth says to her mother in grace, the passage we read, five commitments she made. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. Five conditions she made and she said to her mother in grace, no matter what, I won't leave you. Five conditions. What did she say? Let me read it out for you from what I've written down. I will go with you. I will live with you. I will be your people. Your God will be my God. Your grave will be mine. When you want to follow Jesus, these are the five things you're going to say. <laughs> I will go with you, Jesus. I will be in your presence, God. I will be your people. You, O oh God, are my God. And your grave is my grave. Because like you came out, I'll come out, I know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Five things. Ruth is a Moabitess. Ruth is a cursed woman about whom God said, they cannot enter my presence. She comes from the genealogy, the pedigree that stood against Israel. But Ruth says to Naomi, if you are going to Israel, I'm coming with you. So two women are going back. When her family people in Bethlehem saw her, they hugged her and said, where's your husband? Where are the children? She cried. She said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Call me bitter. Because all are dead. Only my daughter is with me. My second son's wife is with me. She's a Moabitess. She's a cursed woman. How can you bring her? It's okay. She has accepted our God. People, you know, they took it with a pinch of salt. You know what I'm saying? There are people who ask questions like that in the church. Pastor, how can such people come to our church? Calm down. Calm down. Let them come. In the words of Boaz, she has put her trust in the God of Israel and let him bless her. She began to work hard. She began to take care of her mother in grace. You know, there's a law in the book of Leviticus chapter 19 where God said, when the children of Israel, they reap their harvest, they harvest their um, grains, their vegetation, you should leave some grains in the side for poor people to come and eat. God said, you don't have to supply to their house. Let them do some work. Come get up and take it. So they would leave. So what Ruth did, Naomi told Ruth, Darling, this is not like Moab. In our country, people will leave some grains here and there for poor people like you and me. Go pick it up. So she would go around picking up everything and bringing it to her mother and they would eat together. People were watching this. She began to go from field to field and pick up leftovers that were intentional left. And a man called Boaz began to like it. Now, you know, everyone knew she was a Moabitess because she looked different. Because her, 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 Hebrew was a little Moabitess Hebrew. You know what I'm saying? Like Gujarati English. Or like Malayali Hindi. <laughs> hey, come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> right? It, it had that accent. People knew she was a Moabitess. So when, when they see her, they say, hey, Sister Ruth, how are you doing? So nice to see you. And when she goes, they tell, Moabitess. Hello, have you experienced that? Ruth's been seeing all this, but she's been quiet, she's been virtuous, she's been diligent, she's been prayerful. She says, it doesn't matter if people don't love me, I know God loves me. I know the God of Israel loves me. So what if I'm a Moabitess? I have turned to God Almighty. In the course of time, this fellow called Boaz, who was a big landlord, he noticed her. He noticed her hard work. He saw that she was a genuine believer. He noticed that she was genuinely taking care of her mother, mother in grace. And slowly there was something happening between the two. Boaz announced it to the people in leadership. I'm going to marry this Moabitess woman. They said, Boaz, you're a big man. You want to marry a Moabitess girl? He said, she has put her trust in the God of Israel. And I'm ready to marry if. They asked Ruth. She said, of course. <laughs> so romantic. <laughs> they both got married. 
and a cursed Moabitess called Ruth became the grandmother of David the king and became the great 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 grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did God bring a cursed Moabitess into the lineage of Jesus to tell you and me it's not you going to church that makes you special. It's your relationship with Jesus that makes you special. Oh, come on, give him a big, big, big hand clap. God, God has always included room for the Moabites in his holy plan. I want you to know the heart of God is a heart of grace. If you will go through the chambers of God's heart, if you will walk through the cupboards of heaven, if you will take the files of the kingdom of God, you will not find anger and vengeance and evil and enmity, but you will find love and generosity and grace and care because that is the heart of God Almighty. God has a heart of passion for you, a passionate love. Pastor, I'm from Moab. I'm a cursed guy. I've got habits in my life that I can't change. I want you to know, my brother, if you will trust under the wings of Jesus, he will change you and bring you from your Moab into the Bethlehem. Your famine will turn into abundance. Your evil will turn into good. For with God, nothing is impossible. Hallelujah. God always had place for Moabites. Since we're talking about grace, before we do grace, I want to give you simple seven principles on leadership. Number one, before you demand a hand, touch the heart. Before Boaz asked Ruth for marriage, he touched the heart with abundance. Instead of lecturing people, we should take time to listen to people. <laughs> Model generosity, not greed. Don't be so worried about protecting your image. Take care of your integrity. Boaz could have said, I love you. Every night you come, morning you go, because I'm a big guy here. He said, no darling, I love you. I'm not bothered about my image. I'm bothered about my integrity. Demonstrate compassion, not control. Practice servant heart, not selfish heart. Love God and people, not power and positions. Simple principles of leadership that you find from the life of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Talk about the grace of God, three quick things. Grace of God flows to us from the cross of Calvary. When you see a Moabite coming into the kingdom of God, don't stand there and stare, huh? how can that person be saved? Listen, the grace of God that saves you and me saves anybody. And it is the finished work of the cross. You don't have to do anything for your salvation. It is already done by Jesus on the cross. All you have to do is receive it by faith in him. Your faith in Christ is what brings God's abundance into your life. God gave it to us, it's called grace. When we receive it, it's called faith. Faith is the channel with which we receive. Grace is the character of God of giving in abundance. Your healing, your miracle, your prosperity, your future is in the hands of God Almighty. He's given it in Calvary. Reach out by faith and take it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. No Moab can keep you back anymore. You're walking into your victory. Maybe you made a mistake of, you know, uh, you somehow happened to go into Moab. But I want you to know, God can turn our mistakes into miracles. Naomi did a mistake. Naomi did a mistake. But God turned that mistake into a Moabitess becoming a great grandmother of the Holy Son of the Living God. Jesus. Second thing, let's go to Psalm 45 2. Talk about grace. Let's read that together. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Let's read the next line loud and clear. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, you know what God is saying? Learn to talk and behave with grace and I'll pour blessings into your life. 
Hallelujah. Be gracious. Now, all of you are so gracious to me, I tell you, really. You're wonderful people. But how about showing some grace to the parking lot attendants? How about showing some grace to the auto driver who's charging you extra? Now, even if you don't want to give him extra money, you can be gracious in the way you say no. How about showing some grace to people that don't matter? How about showing some grace in our own family? Some extra grace to your wife who don't understand no matter how many times you say. How about showing some grace to your husband no matter how many times you say he just don't understand. How many times pastor? Show some grace. <laughs> Pour some grace into your lips. <laughs> some of you men are looking at me like, how did you know that pastor? <laughs> About my wife pastor? <laughs> I can't tell you. But, no I'm joking. Now, the truth is this. If we pour grace into our lips and into our lifetime expressions, lifestyle expressions, God will pour blessings into everything we do. He will turn your famine into abundance. Hallelujah. Your lackluster will become flammaboyance. Your meager and necessity will become abundance in giving because God can turn your situation around. It's a principle of leadership. Psalm 45 is talking about Jesus, the bridegroom. When grace is poured on your lips, your heavenly father pours out his blessings. Third, let's go to Titus chapter 2. Let's read that together, verse 11 onwards. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, not only in heaven, on this earth in this world where do we look look to Jesus looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great not prophet Jesus not the son of God Jesus not the man Jesus but the great God and Savior Jesus Christ hallelujah Jesus is not just a prophet He's not just a man. He's not just some avatar. He is God who became human. The great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody give him a hand of worship and let him know how much you appreciate his divinity. Hallelujah. When you look to him and you've come under his care, he turns your Moab. Mrs. Ruth, you may be the in the genealogy you may be in the succession you may be in the lineage of a cursed lot and his daughters but when you put your trust in the God of Israel God says hereafter you're not in that lineage I cut you out from there by my grace and I make you in the lineage of my son Jesus God could have chosen other names I promise you God could have picked up so many other social names that are of higher standing. But God picked up a Moabitess woman who is cursed and according to the law of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy of the Bible, she cannot even come into the temple to say a prayer. God picked up such a cursed person and made her the grandmother of David and the great grandmother of Jesus to tell you and me. It doesn't matter how wrong you were when you were born. Doesn't matter what sin has happened in the past of your life. But when you allow the grace to change you and you start walking in righteousness and you say no to the evil of the world, God says, I'll pour my blessing into your life and I'll turn your future around like nobody can ever touch it again. Oh, give him a big thanks as we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Close your eyes, everybody. And say, God, today you spoke to me and I received that word of yours, Lord. It is your scripture and I put my faith in your word. If you could change a Ruth, you can change me. Hallelujah. If you can make the life of Ruth so great, you surely can do the same with me. Her husband died. She was a woman who was a widow. She couldn't expect anything good beyond then. She didn't have children. She could have no hope. She had to move out of her own community. But because she put her trust in you, 
because she came after you, because she made a covenant with you. How beautifully you turned things around. And today, we just want to thank you, Heavenly Father. We want to thank you, Holy Spirit. We want to thank you, Father, because you are a good God. Hallelujah. There is no ending to your mercy. There is no end to your grace. When you show grace, you can lower yourself down to hell and pick up people right from there and get them to be seated with you in the heavenlies. Thank you that we are recipients of your grace. Wherever you are, would you like to lift your hands for a minute? Wherever you are sitting, lift your hands and say, Lord, as an act of worship, I raise my hands to you. I honor you today. I love you today. I worship you today. I thank you that you are the God of Ruth. You are my God. Jesus, you are a prayer answering God. That when I pray, your angels will work on my behalf. I thank you, Jesus. Please put your hands down. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for speaking to our hearts so clearly. That it doesn't matter if we ever went to Moab. All what matters is we get back. That we don't make intentions to live in Moab. But we make intentions to live in Bethlehem. To be in a place of your choice. To be in your will. To walk in what you like. And to be people who are successful. That we live like God's children. That we live in excellence. That we don't live in average. Oh God. That the things that concern you will be the things that concern us. That our heart's devotion will be towards you. That we will not live in anxiety for things of the world. But we will live with a desire for your holy purposes. Hallelujah. We thank you for you are a faithful God. We love you today. Bless your people. In Jesus name we pray. Somebody shout an amen. Hallelujah. How many know God spoke to you today? You know deep in your heart. I want to promise you. You know when I was preparing this message. God put an assurance in my heart. It's this. I felt God telling me as an inspiration, as an assurance. I'm going to move my people from the Moabs of their life into the Bethlehems of their life. And I believe it's going to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we sing a song before we pray and close? Or we'll pray and close? You want to sing it? Okay. I've seen the light flashing and heard the thunder I felt sin's brain dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me still to fight on. He promised never leave me, oh, never to leave me alone.
entangled with briars, ready to cast me down. My Savior whispered his promise, no, never to leave me alone, no, never alone. But in the last service, I suddenly felt like praying for some time. We had a lovely time of prayer. And I thought to myself, even in this service, maybe we should take some time to pray. I don't feel any inspiration, but I thought since there was an inspiration in the last service, before we sing the last stanza, shall we take a few minutes to pray? Let's close our eyes. Everybody, wherever you're standing, talk to the Lord for a few minutes and say, God, you have a plan for my life. I don't want to settle down in the Moab. I want to move into the land of abundance. I don't want to have famine thinking. I want to have leadership thinking. I want your grace to flow through my life. I know Lord, the curse of the past cannot stop the blessings of the future. The curse of the past cannot stop the blessings of the future because you are in my future. I worship you Jesus. Come on, wherever you're standing, open your mouth. Worship the Lord for some time. You feel in the spirit to pray in tongues? Go ahead, pray in tongues for some time. I believe God is bringing you out of your Moab. He's bringing you out of that struggle. He's bringing you out of that habit. He's bringing you out of that addiction. He's bringing you out of that sinfulness. He's bringing you out of that shame. He's bringing you out of that failure. He's bringing you out of that defeat. He's bringing you out of that loneliness. He's bringing you out of that poverty. He's bringing you out of that struggle. Yes, you can't bring yourself out, but God is bringing you out. God is doing a miracle for you. In the relationships of your life, His grace is going to flow. Come on, talk to Him. Open your mouth and talk to Him. Say, Jesus, I receive your word today. I believe in your promise today. You are the one I worship, Lord Jesus. It's not enough to think in your mind. We need to open our mouth and talk to God in confession of prayer. Wherever you're standing, open your mouth and talk to Him for some time. Hallelujah. 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 Curses are breaking this morning. Every power of demonic world is breaking out of your life. You're not going to live in bondage. When you're praying here, His angels are working for you elsewhere. Yes, your prayer will not go in vain. God is a prayer answering God. Hallelujah. Whatever happens to the world, your life is in the world. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. What God has promised in the world is going to happen to you. Hallelujah. The world may go around, but you will stay strong in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and praise Him for some time. Open your mouth and thank Him. Say, God, I believe you. You are my master. You are the God who changed Ruth's life. You will change my life. Somebody, put your hands together. Open your mouth and praise God for some time. Oh God, let the power of your Holy Spirit flow. Let your anointing flow. Let your victory flow. Let there be miracles like never before. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn their night into day. Turn their morning into dancing. Turn their weeping into joy. Hallelujah. Turn the curses into blessing. Turn the death into life. Turn the loneliness into fellowship. Turn the poverty into prosperity. Even right now in the name of Jesus. Heavens be open above your people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Receive it by faith. Receive it from faith. 
Receive it from Jesus. La ba rada rada kanturi ya la ba shaki mantori ya la ba sikiri antara bama hol kaboche. Receive it in Jesus' name. A new life, a new touch, a new power, a new anointing. Come on, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Let the Holy Spirit fill your life. Open your mouth as you worship Him. Masakara ba shiki ni kanturi ya la ba sikiri diya. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Lord, touch your people. Lord Jesus, bless your people. Lord Jesus, anoint your people. Lord Jesus, empower your people into a great victorious future. No devil can stop them. No politics can stop them. No evil can stop them because you are opening their doors. The God who holds the keys of David, that when you open, no man can shut. When you open, no man can shut. When you open, no door can be shut. So now, let the doors of the future be opened in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Angels of God, descend to do work. Descend to do the work. Reveal to do the work. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We rebuke every powers of evil. We cast them out in Jesus' name. Let the people be free by the power of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are a prayer answering God. Thank you that you will not ignore a drop of tear. You will not ignore a heartfelt prayer. You will not ignore a desire and commitment because you love your children. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. Let's sing the next answer before we pray and close. Mm. He died for me on the mountain for me they pierced the side for me he opened that fountain the crimson cleansing time for me he waited in glory seated upon his throne he promised never to leave you for this morning we thank you because your glorious presence is here heavenly God we surrender our heart to you we thank you for your word that we heard we believe that father your word will bring fruit into our lives and that we are continually being changed into your glorious image thank you father because we are changing we are going from Moab into the place of promise into Bethlehem in the name of Jesus thank you Lord father we pray for those who have come to the church for the first time. We pray that, Lord, your goodness, your grace, and your mercy will be upon each and every one of those who came to this church for the very first time. We pray that your presence will continue to be with them and cover them with your grace and mercy, God. Father, we pray for those that are traveling this week. We pray that, Lord, your journey mercies will go with them that your protection will be with them and the purpose for which they are going, they will see that come to pass according to your will, God. We pray for those that are celebrating their birthdays and their anniversaries. We thank you, God, for you have added another year into their lives. And we pray that the year ahead, they will see your glorious promises being fulfilled in their lives and they will see your goodness pass over them, God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for those who have put their hands into the offering. We pray that you will bless their hands, bless the work of their hands. And Father, 
you are the glorious rewarder you are the one who rewards and we pray that lord according to your riches and glory that they will see your blessings and for those who are not able to give god we pray they will see an abundance in the days to come thank you master we once again surrender ourselves into your hands we pray that your name alone will be glorified in everything in jesus mighty name we pray and everyone said amen may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of the father and the sweet and wonderful fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with each one of us now and forevermore amen amen god bless you have a good week have a good week ahead the pastors are here and if you want prayer they are here to pray with you god bless